enjoy the ministry of the of the simstrels of the uh, of the minstrel the musicians amongst us a little bit more so for like a minute maybe not more but like a minute I, I want you to just give a shout of praise just shout like you really want Jericho to fall and this gentleman will help us with a shout just give God a big shout Father we thank you hallelujah Amen. God is good. Let's be seated. Thank you, guys. God bless you. That was phenomenal. That was phenomenal. I know there might be some of you guys, while these guys were playing, you were probably kind of like secretly wishing you can go back in time and learn how to play the musical instrument. Because today was kind of like off the chain. I was there and I'm like, man, I should have continued taking those lessons, you know? But you know what? <clears throat> At the end of the day, God's requirement for praise is actually a lot simpler than what you might think. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so you don't necessarily have to know how to sing or how to play the instrument. You know, one of the instruments recommended in scriptures for us to play is the 10 strings. You know what they are? The 10 fingers. And I know that everybody can clap. And once the Lord said to me, and I was reminded of it just now, that if we will stop taking the word of God as a recommendation. <laughs> Let me say it again once my voice has recovered from that worship. If we will quit taking God's word as a recommendation, you know what's going to happen? It will begin to work for us. <laughs> you see, a lot of what we read in scriptures, we're just like, okay, well said. I'm going to think about it. No, the Bible says that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Do you know that some people wonder why they can't stop worrying? Some people are like, why can't I just stop being afraid? Why can't I? And that's because you do not recognize yet that when the Lord says, fear not, he wasn't advising you, he was commanding you to not be afraid. You see, it is not a recommendation when the Bible says, sing unto the Lord. When the Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, it is not what some people do, it is what you should do. Oh yeah. And she's not even from, and she's not even from Africa. Because some people believe that, oh, shouting in church is a Nigerian thing. And I'm like, okay, David must be Nigerian then. It's a kingdom thing. Because <clears throat> David was no gentleman when it comes to worshiping God. He will dance his robe off. I want to get there. You understand what I mean? And I think I'm pretty close because sometimes I can't even button my shirt right. So it might be a lot easier for me than you. Because if you're two together, sometimes it doesn't help. Praise the Lord. Please give me water. Thank you. I think I know what Bennett did there. He saw that my voice was going out, so he played it louder so I can have a water break. That's excellent. Well played. Well played. 
All righty. Okay, guys. I didn't really sing in the second song. And part of it was um, due to the fact that I was interceding. As I was getting ready for this meeting, as I was being prepared, one of the things that came to my mind is some of the things that we have heard spoken over us are being challenged by the enemy. And I know there are folks in here, you believed that word when it came forth. But we must never forget that we also are at war. So when we say that we are going to possess the gates of our enemies, they have spies too. So sometimes they know we're coming. And the promise of God to us is that once we get there, we will possess the gates of our enemies. And so what the enemy tries to do is he comes to meet you along the way so that you do not get to their gate because they know once you get to the gates, it's over. Victory is yours. And so I was interceding that we will not stop short of what God has promised to us. You know, Jesus says, whoever lays his hands on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. So we need to continue believing unto the saving of our souls. The Bible says, whoever turns back unto perdition, my soul has no pleasure in him. He said, but be ye of the company of them that press forward unto the saving of their souls. It is not enough for you to just receive a word from God. When you get a word from God about your healing, about your, prov about your provision, about the backsliding in your family, when you receive God's word, what do you do? You go and run with it and you hold on to it until you receive that which the Lord has promised. Because way too many times have we encouraged people to be discouraged at the voice of God. Because people hear God and all we do to support them in the process is to keep checking, has it happened, has it happened, has it happened? Some things don't happen until we are part of the process. And so when God gives a word, he wants you to persevere. The Bible says it is through faith and patience that we inherit the promise. And what are the rudiments of patience, long suffering, perseverance, and resilience? So I want to encourage you, don't just stop at receiving the word. Receive the blessing. And sometimes receiving the blessing looks like fighting for it. Let me give you an example and we're going to move on to a couple of other things. You see, when God told the children of Israel that he was going to bring them out of Egypt, they had a, they had a part to play. And the part they had to play was to be safe and sound under the seal of the blood. Now, many times we think that was an easy thing to do. These guys have been in slavery for hundreds of years. They have been accustomed to responding whenever the master calls. Whenever somebody shouts anywhere near them, they're supposed to respond because they were the ones who would be the first responders. And the Lord told them to not leave their houses no matter what happens. Think about it. If you have always been employed and your father before you and, your, and his father before him by these same people, would you not be afraid for once that maybe if you don't go out and do what they want you to do that night, there might not be a job the next day? Because they were not yet free. They were working with the word of promise. Emmanuel, God bless you. I really just want to say that that sound was phenomenal. You know, and without what you're doing, without sound, I'm not even sure how I can speak right now because my voice is almost gone. But I tell you what, these guys believed that God will show up the next day. Your masters needed you. You could hear them screaming and shouting because their children were dropping dead. And you stayed behind closed doors. You could only do that if you have come to the conclusion that God will show up in the morning. Because if God didn't show up in the morning, that meant you had no livelihood. 
and you would get beaten and bruised badly because the masters would come and say we were screaming all through the night and you didn't even come out to check on us what would you say and so it was not as easy as we think about it when we think about what they did having to pin themselves down in that place was the beginning of the battle for their victory when God gives you a word of promise, you need to learn how to be like the children of Israel who pinned themselves behind the doors of their little sheds in Goshen. And why is that? Because Satan will want to draw you out by fear. Satan will want to draw you out by making you believe more in yourself than in the God who gave you the word of promise. Do you know how many times God has said to you that I would take care of you, but all through the night you cannot sleep, you are tossing and turning because you just believe that you need to do something you need to learn how to pin yourself down because God has already given you his word the reason why many of us miss our delivery from heaven is because Satan tells us that you know what it's 9 a.m. they haven't delivered this parcel maybe you need to go and look for it but the question we forget to ask Satan is where am I going to look for the blessing I don't particularly know the storehouse, the, particularly, the particular storehouse in heaven that the blessing is coming from. It's like someone waiting to receive an Amazon delivery. And at 9 a.m. you don't get the delivery and you decide to go out of the house to go look for it. Where will you go? You see, because the one you follow, you be like. You become like the one you follow. And Satan is very aimless. He says, I am just going to and fro. So the moment you follow the leading of Satan, you start going to and fro as well. And you expend all of your resources and energy, whereas your blessing was delivered while you were gone looking for it. Do you know that many things that we get agitated about, that we believe that until I get this house, until I get this book written, until I get this thing done, ah, I, I can't be at peace. And God is saying, I've already given you peace. You don't need that house to have joy. So you leave all of the real blessings behind, the peace, the joy, and you've been looking for material things. And that's why Jesus says, after these things do the Gentiles seek. He said, but you don't have to run after those things. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. You know, when we were growing up, we thought seeking first the kingdom of God was just going to church and sweeping the floor and washing the toilet and doing all of the religious rituals that everybody does. But when you ask yourself, what did the Bible say about what the kingdom really is? The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is not in meat, it is not in drink. It is not in material things that you believe your life depends on. He says, but it is in righteousness, peace, and joy. So my primary focus should be on being at peace and being joyful, even if I haven't got the material things. The Bible says, that the abundance, the sufficiency of a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he owns. You see, because if you have not already found righteousness, peace, and joy by recognizing and believing that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, nothing that you ever receive can give you the peace and the joy that you need. Remember when your car was only $600? that you bought from somebody who was looking to throw it away. He was more beat up than a banger. You would go to sleep and not even take the key out of it because ain't nobody wants your beat up car. And now, by some magic or miracle, let's, this is church, by some miracle, you get, a, yeah, you get a new RAV4, brand new, two miles on the odometer when you pick it up. And now, you can no longer sleep at night. Every time you hear the sound of a car at 2 a.m., you're looking through the window. You can't even sleep in the room anymore because your bedroom is far from where the car is parked. You sleep in the living room. Every time you hear something, and then you know the devil knows how to play tricks on us. That very moment when you have that new car, you start getting amber alerts. 
that someone's car has been stolen. You're like, in the mighty name of Jesus, they will not steal my car. The way it really works is this. Find peace before the blessing comes so that you can enjoy it. The reason why some of the material things that we have asked God for, the reason why they have been delayed is because of the fact that God knows that you're not where you need to be yet to receive them. Because if you do not own righteousness, peace, and joy, before you own things, those things will own you. Have you not seen the trend these days that people who haven't found peace in Christ Jesus, joy in the Holy Spirit, who have not embraced the righteousness that the Father gives, even when God gives them children, they don't own those children, those children own them because they're so afraid that if they don't do all of what the child says, oh, the child may be unhappy and you're dancing around the child, whereas you're supposed to sit and let the child dance around you. If you know who you are in Christ Jesus and you know the authority with which you're supposed to live life, you will not chase things. Things will bring themselves to you and you will be the one to sit there like a royalty and say, well, next. I don't want to see you today. Next. But what are we doing? We're busy chasing things because we don't know who we are. And Satan wants to continue to keep us not knowing who we are simply because the moment we settle the issue of identity, the issue of prosperity is taken care of. Because everything that has been given to you is only available when you can present your identity to receive your prosperity. And so Satan doesn't want you to know that you're royalty. He doesn't want you to know that you have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. To be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus means as far as the Father is concerned, you have already been brought into alignment with heaven. So you don't need to attempt to do things to please God or to please men. You are just sitting in your position as one who was made perfect by grace through faith so that every force that governs life recognizes that now you know who you are. When I still ran around chasing things, the Holy Spirit got tired of me chasing things. So one day he said to me, he said, sit down here. I sat down and then he showed me a picture. I saw three men and they had question marks on their heads. And then there was one who sat down with a smile on his face. And this scripture came saying, have you seen diligent men? The Bible says diligent men will stand before kings and not unknown men. And so when I saw the man who sat and I saw the other people with, with question marks on them, there were people who came in and they came in with wealth. Some of them came in with documents that looked like title deeds. Some of them came in with jars of water. Some of them came in with precious ointments. They were bringing all kinds of precious things and they were passed by the three men with question marks upon their heads and they were laid down in front of the one who had a smile on his face. So I said to myself, I said, Holy Spirit, you, I, I need to be more diligent. He said, you're missing the point. He said, why are they taking everything and giving it to the man whose face you can see. That was when he hit me. I, up until that time, could only see myself as a diligent man, wherein I believed that everything that I would receive is based on my diligence. But the man who sat down had no question mark on his head because he already knows who he is. The Bible says, have you seen diligent men? Now think about that scripture again. The Bible says they will stand before kings and not unknown men. An unknown man is not a man who is, is not particularly someone that is not famous. An unknown man is a man who is unknown to himself. The Bible says that the primary assignment of wisdom in the life of a man is to allow the man to know himself. And so many of us, we haven't come to know who we are. And we think about ourselves as the diligent people who need to run around to make things happen. No, there are enough forces in life that are running around that do not sleep because they're spiritual forces making things happen. They can work better than you can ever dream of. And they're looking to serve you only when you know who you are.
And the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, I need you to just be like the one who knows who he is. And the diligent forces of life will bring blessings to you. And it will make you stand out from amongst these other people who do not know themselves. Let me tell you something, folks. The work that you need to do is the work of knowing who you are. It is the work of knowing who you are. Your diligence needs to be exercised toward knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. And the moment you can see yourself in the realm of the spirit for who you are, everyone in the spirit realm in heavenly places looking for you will find you. Now, let me say this, because I see that many people are kind of like wondering, okay, what about those three men? Who are they? Why are they unknown? How come they have question marks? How can I be like the one who had a smile on his face? There were certain things that the Lord started to show me around that period of time. One of it is this. He said to me, he said, those other people with question marks are the ones who have refused to accept what the Lord has said about them. You know, there are three things that the Lord says about you. Many people exist who do not even have the wisdom of God for their existence. Question mark number one represents the lack of wisdom. Question mark number two represents the lack of understanding. Question mark number three represents the lack of knowledge. And every single one of us, as long as we are unaware of the reason why we were made and how we will become and what we will become, we are like those men that cannot be found by the true riches of heaven. So what do you do with that piece of information? You need to establish before God and in your heart why he made you. Because the reason why we run around for things is because many of us do not know how important we are to God. I've given you this analogy before that my car or your car does not need gas because your car is not going anywhere. Have you woken up one day, tried to get into your RAV4 and somebody says to you, the RAV4 says to you, um, can you wait for me? I need to go check on the um, Honda next door. I have a meeting of Toyotas downtown. No, your car is not going anywhere. The reason why that car exists is to serve you. And in order for it to serve you, it needs certain things like gas. Remember that wisdom is what in the mind of God answers the question why. So if you don't know why you exist, you will be chasing things. Because many of us are unaware of the significance of our existence to the kingdom of heaven. But the moment you know that God made you so that he can reveal his glory through you, then guess what? You begin to rest in him knowing fully well that if you need X, Y, and Z for the glory to be made manifest, the one who needs glory to shine will make it happen. The work that I have to do is just do the work of fending off the doubt. The work of fending off the distrust. Because quite often, doubt is not even the problem. Many of us, it's not like we doubt. It's just that we just don't trust God enough. And someone is like, is that not the same thing? No, 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 no. There's a slight difference. You see, doubt is when God says a thing to you. And in your head, you're still thinking about it. But deep within your soul, you don't even believe it. Every action of yours, the intent behind it is for self-preservation instead of God, reliance. The Bible says that the word of God knows the difference between your thoughts and your intentions. So I may be thinking, oh, God is good. But my next action may not show that I truly believe that God is good. Because I'm like, I know God is good, but to be honest, heaven helps those who help, them, those who help themselves. I need to do something while God is still waiting to be God. Whereas the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's always God. And so you need to resolve that within your subconscious. That you know what? 
If God is good, God is good. I believe it and all of my intentions, intentions are the forces behind your actions. What are thoughts? Thoughts are the rhythms behind your deliberations. When you're thinking, you're deliberating what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it. But the real intention behind what you're doing is in your subconscious mind. It is the force behind your motives. And if that thought is not in alignment, the subconscious thought, if it's not in alignment with the conscious thought, as heaven is concerned, you do not have faith. Because the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. To be double-minded means to be thinking something subconsciously other than what you're thinking subconsciously. Consciously, subconsciously. How do you remediate that? You need to continue to profess and meditate on what God's word says enough for you to believe it. So you settle the issue of righteousness by knowing why you exist. Because the moment you know why you exist, you and God are on the same page. You are now rightly aligned with God. That is what? Righteousness. Question number one, canceled. What is the second question? The second question has to do with how you are going to become what God wants you to be. And I'm going to give you a good example in scriptures of how somebody showed up in the presence of God with those three questions and they were answered by Angel Gabriel. And I think that's the time that some of you can breathe because right now I feel like people are really looking serious, like we're going to have an exam afterwards. The second question is the question of how will these things be? And the reason why we need to have that question answered is because it is the number one thief of your peace if you don't know how it's going to happen. God says, I'm going to leave this place where I'm at, where I'm struggling with these other people who don't like me very much. God says that I'm going to be surrounded by peace all around like Solomon was surrounded by peace all around. But I don't see how they will stop bothering me. I don't see how it's going to happen. And because you can't answer the question how, which is a function of having an understanding of your purpose, not just knowing your purpose, but having an understanding, you lose your peace. And when you do not have that peace, your heavenly blessings cannot come. Why? Because your heavenly blessings only come when you have the righteousness, the peace, and the joy, because there needs to be an alignment. The Bible says, let your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And in heaven, there is righteousness, peace, and joy. And so you know what that looks like to the angels bringing your blessing? They want to deliver your Amazon package, but they only have the street number, not the street name. So the address of this place is what? 1725 Spectrum Drive. And then the zip code is G830043. That's a little advertisement there plugged in. If the angel is coming and all they have is, okay, is answer the question of wisdom, the question of why God made him or her, that is 1725. But then we need a street name because there are so many 1725s. But you need to answer that second question of how will these things be? And the one who is sitting and smiling already knows how it's going to be. How is it going to be? It is going to be by the faithfulness of the one who promised. The Bible says that Abraham, initially when he received the word from God, he was like, mm, I need to help God to fulfill this word. Himself and his wife, they plotted together. And he, he, he got with, with uh, Hagar. And she got pregnant. And he was like, God, I'm helping you. I got myself a seed. Now can you multiply this seed? And God is like, what seed? And he was like, uh... And God was like, okay, don't worry. We'll see how happy you are in the next two years. Trouble broke out. It was terrible. Because Sarah, the same woman, who said, oh, this is a good idea, changed her mind. You change your mind. I'm, I'm not going to sing that song for Alan's sake. But here is the deal. You need to know, and the Bible says that Abraham resolved that issue within himself the moment he realized that the one who promised is the one who would do it. Because he came to the point where he was like, wait a minute, why am I even expecting that I would have a child if not that he promised? I was happy where I was. Maybe not too happy, but I was just like getting on with it. You came here with this fancy idea of me becoming the father of many nations. Everybody called me Abram for the first 60 years of my life and I didn't punch anyone in the face. And then you told me that I will be Abraham, the father of many nations. 
And so if you said it, then you're going to do it because I was okay just as I was. Just like me, I was fine without being born. Yeah, because I didn't ask for this. You understand what I mean? I did not ask for this. Wherever I was in the ether, I was doing just fine. And God came up with this idea. He's like, man, 2023 is going to come and people will lose their minds. I need the prophet to speak to the church. So while I was yet in my mother's womb, in fact, he said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And I'm like, oh, indeed, you could have just left me where I was. Because whatever that was, they didn't have inflation. I knew that. You understand what I mean? And so if it didn't start with me, then why should it not be my problem? The Bible says that Adam, Abraham gave glory to God, knowing that the one who promised is faithful, who will also do it. God is the one doing everything. He just wants you to be his showcase. He just wants to show up through you. And all he's asking you to do is to fight everything that wants to remove you from where he placed you. Because where he puts you, where his word tells you to go, is exactly where his word is going to find you. Question number three is the question that takes your joy. And that is the question of not having a knowledge of what God is doing. You know, the first one is wisdom. Wisdom asks us the question, why is God doing it? Why does he have me here? Question number two is how is he going to perform everything that he has said concerning me? And question number three is the question that answers the, I mean, is the, is the question what? What exactly am I supposed to be doing right now? What exactly is he about to reveal through me? The Bible says by wisdom a house is built, by understanding it is established, and by knowledge it is filled with all precious things. And when the precious things are there, what does it mean? In heavenly language, it means that your joy is full. When the Holy Spirit broke it down to me, he said you need to know the answer to question number one, because that is you. You are those four people, but you can always choose which one you want to be. The one that does not know why he's here or how things will come about or what things exactly I am doing. If you are those men, the diligent forces of life will, no long, will not know how to find you. You have to be able to answer those four questions. So look at the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Bible says that when the angel of the Lord Gabriel came to Mary, he said to Mary, Oh, blessed, the most blessed are you amongst women. The Lord has chosen to bring his only begotten son into the world through you. And she was like, well, oh, that sounds great. But how will these things be? Seeing that I am yet to be married, seeing that I am just a little teenage girl, what is all these things you're talking about? I haven't even known a man. How would these things be? But guess what? She asked the question and immediately said, nevertheless, be it unto me according to your word. And as soon as she said that, the angel was able to give her the full knowledge of what was to happen and her joy was full because the Bible says she began to rejoice in the Lord. You will rejoice and you will be at peace and you will be immovable when you know that God made you for his purpose. And the same God who made you for his purpose is the one responsible for how you are going to become. And what you need to be doing right now is also available by the leading of his Holy Spirit so that you are never without joy. You are not ever without peace and you are always seeing yourself as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And by so doing, guess what? All these other things will be added to you. Everything that you are believing God for has already been released by heaven and those angels are waiting just for your address to show up on their screen in a complete format. And once the address shows up, everything just begins to happen. But I tell you one thing. I was praying earlier and interceding because the Lord said to me that some are not standing firm and the enemy will distract them before the blessing comes. And that is the reason why it is important for you to know what I have just said. 
you need to learn how to resist the urge to follow the leading of your emotions. You know, people ask me every now and again, Brother Moses, what does it mean to walk in the spirit? You know, the Bible says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I always tell them it's very easy to walk in the spirit. Think about how you walk in the natural. How do you walk in the natural? Antoine, come, let me use you as an example so that at least you get a reward for sitting up front today. Can you please come up stage? Praise God, let's celebrate this man of God. Awesome. What is he doing right now? He's walking. Okay, so I am where you're going to. You're coming to me. Okay, so how would you get to me without running and without jumping? You walk. Very good. So why are you walking this way and not that way? Because I'm here. So walking in the natural can simply be defined as taking incremental steps toward a fixed destination. He didn't just attempt to take one step because that would become a split and that would be the end of the show. <laughs> We're just going to go home. You see what I mean? But guess what? He didn't take one big step. Even though there was a chasm between he and I, he decided to take incremental steps. But he was making progress each time because he was going in the direction. So to walk in the spirit is to allow the things of the spirit determine every step that you take. This step, is he taking me closer to the image of Christ or is he taking me farther away? If you can answer that question, it is over. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. God bless you. I tell you what, folks, it is not more difficult than that. Many of us get confused. They're like, oh, how am I going to do this thing? How is this thing going to be? The Lord is saying one step at a time. Just as long as it's in the right direction. And so if God already says to me that he has a husband. Okay, no, I'm a, I'm a woman. I'm a man. Yeah, I'm a man. <laughs> let, me, let me use a, a good example. Okay? <laughs> Say that again. I sh okay, I should use that example, not myself. Okay, so let's assume that there is a woman who's been promised a husband by God. And God, and you already know that God does not give people husbands who are unbelievers because he said, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So if my husband, oh sorry, if the woman's husband <laughs> is going to be a believer, then what's going to happen is the woman should not walk in the direction of a nightclub because that's not where you find believing men. So in order to achieve that promise, even though the woman cannot see the husband just yet, the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Walking by faith is walking according to the spirit. So what do you do? You move closer in the direction of what it means to be alongside a godly man. You understand what I mean? Which means walk away from trash talking friends. Because that godly man is not going to be part of that conversation. It means deleting your music library where you listen to witches and wizards. You understand what I'm saying? And so that's how you begin. Because this godly man, the Bible says evil communications corrupt good manners. You are not walking toward a man who engages in evil communication. So what do you do? You walk away from it. And then the next thing that you do is you walk away from extreme feminism that tells you that you don't need a man. Because God says it is not good for a man or woman to be alone. That is what it means to walk in the spirit. But the devil be dancing around you all the time. And the devil is like, girl, you're thirsty. It's been a minute. There's a nightclub down the road. God is not going to be mad. You don't even have to go home with him. You just need to dance with him. You just need someone to whisper some sweet nothings in your ear. And so this man of God does not whisper 
sweet nothings. Because the Bible says, have you found the wise man? His words are seasoned with understanding. So he's not whispering sweet nothings. He's a faithful witness whose words deliver. The Bible says the one who is the faithful and true witness, their words bring deliverance. But the ones who speak of their own accords will rob you of essence. So why do you want to go to sweet nothings when you should be walking in this direction? But God promised you, Pastor Moses came and he prophesied and everybody bore witness. You recorded it. You keep playing it to yourself. But guess what? You don't just play the prophecy and also play into the hands of the enemy. You play the prophecy and play your part in moving closer in the realm of the spirit to what God has for you. When the Holy Spirit spoke to me earlier today and he said to me that many people are going to miss out on the prophecies that have come forth, my heart broke because I'm like God. He came from his holy habitation, sending forth his word to bring healing to his people. He found his prophet that he's been drilling and schooling and raising and training to get the confidence and boldness and the gifting of the Holy Spirit and in the divine unction to bring the word and you are the ones that will now make it not happen. No, we need to fix that. Because all of the effort that God in heaven has made will not be in vain. So what do we do? We need to correct our mentality. We need to redirect our steps. We need to caution ourselves from playing to the enemy's hands. Into the enemy's hands. Let me tell you something. After they resisted giving in to the temptation and the urge to go serve the masters of yesterday, the Lord delivered them from the angel of death. And so they left that place, but the battle was not yet over. Even to claim the promised land, they needed to keep fighting oppositions. Oppositions will come. Let me tell you something. There will be a counterfeit man. Satan already knows that this woman is believing God for a godly man. So he will find one of his messengers and disguise him as an angel of light. And he's going to put him right there. On the left hand side. Because you know, Jesus says the Lord will separate them, some to his right hand and the others to the left. And the left, he says, their case is already settled. They will be destroyed in fire. And so Satan will put that other man to the left and he's going to be telling you all the stuff that you want to hear. Quite often, that is always an indication of where you must not go. Simply because the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is the destruction. Sometimes God wants to test your heart. That one that is telling you all the stuff that you want to hear is probably not of God because if it's of God it's going to rough your feathers a little bit because he's in your life to bring about change not to accommodate complacency. When I was still dating the Holy Spirit allowed me to date a couple of people that were packaged by Satan himself. In case you're one of them and you're watching, I have prayed for you. <laughs> but you know how this thing was working? After a while, I noticed something. I was like, why is it always ending the same way? There was a vicious cycle that I was dealing with. And the Holy Spirit was, was like, oh, okay, now it looks like you're ready to talk. I said, yeah, I'm ready. I ain't doing this no more. I'm losing time, I'm losing money, and I'm losing face. Because now it's beginning to appear as though I'm the one with the problem. Because everyone is like, wow, you keep breaking up, what's going on? <laughs> oh yeah, and so I went to the Lord, and the Lord said to me, this person is exactly like this other person. I said, why even though she was six inches shorter? <laughs> wow, and that other person, I'm like, man, this other one, the, she didn't even live on the same continent. So how is this thing happening? And the Lord said to me, he said, your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. The Bible says that the heart of a man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. So when people tell you follow your heart, tell them I reject that in Jesus' name, I will follow the spirit. <laughs> Do not follow your heart. Let me say that again. Because the Bible says, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. You know why? Because your heart does not want change. Your heart does not want to be bothered. Your heart wants to be as it is. It wants to be comfortable. 
And that is the reason why I kept choosing the same kind of girl because they were willing to accept me as I was. Everything I was doing was right. Every fake dream that I casted was exactly what they wanted to be. You understand what I mean? And I was just loving it. Every time I meet a girl and I'm like, oh, this is what I want to be, what I want to do. They're like, man, you're doing it already. You're doing it so well. And I'm like, of course I am. <laughs> and, and I would have stayed at that level, but the Lord did not let it happen. Simply because he has for you somebody who is going to oppose you so that they can support you. Have you tried to put two sticks together to make a tent and both of them are facing the same direction? They will fall and the noise of it will be loud. But the word of, the, of God describing a man and a woman being joined together is the same words that Jewish carpenters used in describing pitting two sticks together to make a roof. It means opposing to support. And that is the reason why I'm always thinking this way and my wife is thinking the other way. It used to bother me, but I've seen those times that I ran with my own ideas. I saw how flat on my face I fell. So I have come to celebrate the opposition. So when I wake up and I'm like, man, this Wednesday morning is great. And my wife says it's Thursday. I'm like, oh, excuse me, forgive my foolishness. Of course it is Thursday. What else could it be? You understand what I mean? Simply because if we don't learn how to make the most of the help that God has for us, we will continue to deny ourselves the pleasure of being helped. It's simple English. Help is supposed to be permitted. But all that man, you see that man that is on the left, all that man is telling you is exactly what you want to hear right here. But the you that is meant to be with that man of God is not this version of you that is here. Because this version of you is still three or four steps away from the mark. Every step that you take, you're growing because you're going up steps. You understand what I mean? You're not just moving forward, you're also moving upward. And so the height that you're at determines what you see. And so if you see this man and he's everything that you want, you are too far away to see all of what God has for you. That means you're not yet high up enough. So what do you do? You recognize that, wait a minute, if this man just wants me the way that I am, I don't have to change anything, he's probably not the one. I'm gonna keep pressing forward until I get to this mark. The word of God for you is gonna to come to pass when you're willing to fight off the opposition of temptation. You need to learn to fight off the opposi opposition of being unnecessarily comfortable. Many of us, we accept what Satan brings and that's the reason why we don't have room to receive what God has sent. You accept the level that you're at because you don't want to pray more. You don't want to fast more. You don't want to study the word of God more. You don't want to be more disciplined. And you just want to stay where you're at. And your heart is encouraging you to do the same. Folks, I'm going to wrap it up at this point. But I want to quickly answer a question that Olivia asked me after service on, Sunday, on Saturday. So on Saturday, I spoke to you about the righteousness of God, how God himself points three men out to us in history that God refers to as righteous men. One of them is Job, the other one is Noah, and the third one is who? Daniel. And I started by talking about Noah, that many of us, the reason why we are unable to maintain the righteousness of God that we are in Christ Jesus is when we wake up in the morning, we wake up feeling like we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, like he loves me and he's gonna take care of me. He's gonna perfect everything that concerns me. This little thing that I'm not doing right just yet, he is gonna make it right because he is getting me to go from good to better and from better to becoming my best in Christ Jesus. For the word of God says that the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter until the perfect day. You wake up psyching up yourself like David does, encouraging himself in the Lord. You encourage yourself that, you know what? I got this because the Lord's got me. And then by 11 a.m., someone sends you a text message calling you out on something. And now you suddenly feel the need to go and do something about it. And you lose your rest in him. Noah means rest. Noah attained righteousness because he learned how to just rest in God. Your righteousness requirement number one 
know how to rest in him. Righteousness requirement number two is know how to allow God to be your judge. Daniel means God is my judge. Many times, Emma, you know what happens is this. God has already said to you, you are my anointed one. You are my beloved. You are a royal priesthood, a king and a priest. That is heaven's verdict over you. But somebody comes and says, you're not caring enough. If you cared about me, you wouldn't do that. And now you start to doubt whether you care enough or not. I tell people, and I'm telling you again and again, no matter what anybody says they require of you to do, it will never be enough. The only thing that will be enough is what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. The Bible says that godliness with contentment is great gain. But if you're trying to please people, their appetites are insatiable. People are never satisfied. You can give them everything that you have. They will take it. And then one day they see you with something new that God has given to you. So they're like, oh, so Anita, you had that when I came to you the other day. And now you have to start defending yourself saying, well, when you came, I gave you everything that I had. God just gave me this one. They're like, indeed. You see what I mean? God cho chooses for you to live a life without burden. Jesus says, my burden is light and my yoke is easy. Instead of choosing to be pleasing to God, you want to be men pleasers. Men can never be pleased. Have you not noticed? If men can be pleased, I'll be a politician. I please everybody get elected and get elected again because I'm just always so pleasing to them. But that's the most difficult thing to do. And so what is the third one? Job. What is the meaning of Job? Job means hated. The hated one. Someone that people don't like. And so God says... Even if they don't like you, you're still my righteousness in Christ Jesus. God wants you to be comfortable being hated and still feeling loved. Hey. Brother Nathan, I can be hated by people. It's okay. As long as I am loved by God. You see, many of us, we put too much premium on how people feel about us. The same people who woke up with a different emotion than they had after breakfast. You now want to rely on where you stand in that flimsy heart of theirs? No, God says you are my righteousness in Christ Jesus. You do things not to promote love or acceptance in the minds of other people. You do things to fulfill all righteousness that you may get my commendation. God will say, you are my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. Jesus did not try to make anybody like him. If anything at all, the people that were liking him, not for the sake of the father, he dropped them very quickly like they were hot. When people came to Jesus, after he fed 4,000 men, they said amongst themselves, they were like, huh, we're just going to make this one king. They wanted to make him king not for the forgiveness of sins. They wanted him to be king so that their flesh can continue, be continue to be pleased. And Jesus says, no, that's not what we do here. You have to accept me by accepting my father. So I want to say this to you folks. Your righteousness is from God. Isaiah chapter 54, I believe, it says, my anointed ones, their righteousness is of me. God is the one that gives you righteousness. You might be hated, but he loves you. The world is asking you to do more because they say you're not doing enough, but you are Noah, rest in him. And ultimately, let him be your judge. I didn't finish saying all of that on Saturday, so that is just to add to Saturday's message. Now we're going to break bread. And today we're going to break, break bread from the book of Romans. And you're going to see, let's just go, let's go to the book of Romans. God wants you to receive the fullness of what he has promised. And you need to be that man. Because if you are that man or woman who is yet to know himself or herself, you will not be found by the faithfulness of God. This is another thing that the Holy Spirit explained to me. I'm gonna just drop that very quickly so that we don't take too long. He said to me, what is the most diligent force you know? And I had to think about it. Say that again. You said the Holy Spirit, that's a good answer. 
love that oh that's a great answer you know because the bible says that love never fails but the answer that the holy spirit wanted from me which he also inspired within me was faithfulness the faithfulness of god is the most diligent force there is the bible says it doesn't matter as long as a dawn breaks the mercy of god is renewed the faithfulness of god is what allows for everything that God has said to come to pass. Because he has committed himself by his faithfulness that the Bible calls the two immutable things that guarantee the fulfillment of promise. The fact that God himself is the one watching over every word to perform it. And so if the most diligent force, a force that can never be stopped, is the faithfulness of God, then that same faithfulness of God is what will stand before you, bringing to you as a king everything that you desire. But he doesn't bring things to men that are unknown. You need to know yourself. And what does it mean to know yourself? You know yourself in the light of who God is. Alrighty, so that's just a quick summary of everything that I've been saying. Now come to Romans chapter 15 verse 4 and let's look at this together. The Bible says in Romans chapter 15 verse 4, if I were going to read another scripture from the Old Testament just so that you can have those two legs to stand on. He says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The Bible says that we, through what? Through our learning, we attain patience and the comfort of what the word of God says so that we can what? We can have hope. I submit to you today, folks, that God is only asking you to be patient. What he has said will come to pass. In the meantime, give glory to him. In the meantime, make sure that you're not taking any step in the direction of self-help. You do not need to be DIY with God because he says, I will perform it because I am doing the work. You understand what I mean? And so that way you can sleep and be at rest and the work that you need to do, you can do it with focus and with concentration. Some people do not like the jobs that they're doing right now. It's not paying you enough. You're getting frustrated. And that is the reason why you can't find the better job that God already has for you. The fact that you're worrying about where you're at is making you do badly where you're at. The salary is not enough and they're already thinking about cutting your pay because you're not delivering. Whereas there is another opportunity and they're waiting for you, but you are too agitated to even look and see with clarity where God wants you to be. So worrying and not being patient and not being comfortable in God's faithfulness is only depriving you more. The Bible says when you study scriptures, you see how God operates and that's what gives you the patience and the comfort to wait on the Lord. You know that while you're waiting for that next job opportunity and you haven't lost your peace and you have joy where you're at, where you're at and you know you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, guess what? You will give your best where you're at. There will be peace around you regardless of the agitation of people who do not like you. And when you finally get that phone call interviewing you for that other one, you will sound so ready for it that they'll be questioning themselves, why haven't we hired this person before today? Why? Why haven't we? Why, why haven't we? Recently, our brother Kenyatta got a job and they said to him, we have like five other people we want to interview, but we don't even want to talk to them anymore. No, we don't. We're just happy. We're just happy. And that is how we need to be because people are looking for kings. They're not looking for rogues. The book of Zechariah chapter one. The book of Zechariah. Zechariah, and then I promise you, this one, we're going to break bread. We're just going to read it and break bread. Maybe a little explanation. If my wife is not texting me yet, we're going to just go ahead and break bread. Did they take Zechariah from my Bible? I can't seem to find it. Okay, Zephaniah and Zechariah, they're hidden somewhere here. Mekanaun Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi. Okay, the song helps. 
Now look at what the Bible says in verse 17 of Zechariah chapter 1. I'm going to show you three things here very quickly if there is time. The Bible says, again, Brother Nathan, good to see you. Stephanie, welcome back. Welcome back to where you belong. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You saw that coming, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> More like you asked for it. <laughs> God is good. Again, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. That's thing number one. You see, the God that speaks to you Zechariah, Zechariah, the Bible that I'm reading is the New King James translation, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 17. Again, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. When I saw this thing, I think I've shared it with you once before. It hit me. Now, wait a minute. The Lord of hosts has spoken, but God is saying that I need to proclaim that he has spoken. The God that speaks to you, Chris, is the Lord of hosts. What does it mean? He is the Lord of the army of angels. When the one that commands the biggest army in the world speaks, that is power. You understand what I mean? He doesn't have to do anything. He just has to speak. And all the angels will be moving in every direction. In every direction, in every direction. Have you ever seen the president of the, of the United States or any serious government in the world going to fight some war, carrying a sword and trying to poke another enemy? No, they just give the word and thousands of soldiers were rush to where they have given the command. And the Lord is saying to you and I that we need to proclaim that the Lord of hosts has spoken. So when the thought comes to your mind that maybe what God has said is not going to come to pass, you need to shut down that thought and say, do you know who told me what I am believing for? It's not, I didn't hear this from Pastor Moses. I heard this from the Lord of hosts. That is the reason why the Bible says that through scriptures, you have hope and then it makes you patient and you have comfort while you're waiting. Simply because you know the one who has spoken. Because the Bible says faithful is he who has promised who will also do it. And so you need to start to proclaim. The reason why many of us are intimidated by the voice of the enemy is because we keep hearing our own voices in our heads. Our own little voices. And you know, your own voice is not powerful enough. Why? Because it's fragmented. You debate amongst yourself. You're not possessed with demons. It's just you. You know, you have all these voices in your head because I know a lot of people worry about it. You know, I was reading, I was sharing with Alan. I recently came across a, a, an interesting book. It's called The Testament of, uh, of, of Reuben. It was believed to have been written by Reuben just before he died as a guide to his children. And he said to them, he reminded them that God has seven spirits and you are made in the image and in the likeness of God. He said to them, he says, there are several consciences within you. You need to know the ones to listen to. Because you know how it is sometimes you debate within yourself. How many people sometimes feel like they have a boardroom in their heart? Exactly. And that is the reason why your own voice is not powerful enough because it's so distributed. You, you can't even agree sometimes. I used to try to be in agreement with myself. After a while, I recognized that it is easier for me to get all these goons to just agree with God. Oh yeah, because all the thoughts in your mind, which one takes preeminence? You have the thought of culture in your mind, the things of the culture that you were raised in. You hear the voices of your mom, the voices of your dad, the voices of your own laziness. Sometimes you hear the voices of your own ambition. They're not gonna to submit to one another. It's not a democracy, it's war. That's why the Bible says it is deceitful, the heart of man, because there's nothing precise. So what do you do? You tell every one of those little voices in your mind, in this heart, in this heart, we all follow what God says. And everybody bows because the Bible says at his name, every knee will bow. So stop trying to combat the devil with your own voices. Just tell them the Lord of hosts has said. You know how the Holy Spirit broke this thing down to me? After he showed me this, he took me to the book of Jude. And he says, what happened when the strongest angel in heaven came down to earth on a God-given assignment and Satan tried to stop him? The Bible says that when Satan stopped Michael from retrieving the body of Moses from where God hid it, God hid it so well that Satan couldn't find it. So Satan was like, at some point, whatever you hid, you come and get it. So he waited. He knew how precious Moses' body was to God. 
and how dangerous of a weapon it would have been if it was found by people. You know, if people found that body of Moses, they'd be worshiping it till today because that body could no longer decay. It had been transfigured. It was no longer decaying. It was a living body, the kind of body we're going to receive when Jesus comes. And so when Satan saw that body, he was like, it's over. I can enthrone my own king. This is just the body. We will possess it. We will make it move. You all know where I'm going with this? It's the last trick that Satan is going to pull. The Bible says the Antichrist will create an image and give it a voice and everybody will bow. Satan's been trying to do that since forever. He found a body that was just an available body, that was, an, that was a heavenly body. He was ready to possess that body all day long. That would have been the kingdom of the Antichrist 3,000 years ago or maybe even more. So guess what? It had to be the strongest angel in heaven because that body should not get into the wrong hands. So when Michael came and he got the body, Satan was like, where do you think you're going? You know, this is my territory. And he could have defended himself because even Jesus called him the God of this world. He could have said, look, even Jesus knows that I'm in charge here. What did Michael say? Michael said to him, again, it has been said to you, proclaim that the Lord of hosts has spoken. Michael said to Satan, he says, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. He did not use his own words. He was connected to heaven enough to hear. The father spoke from heaven, saying, Satan, no, 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 not that body. But Satan pretended like he didn't hear God. Michael had to tell him, the Lord has rebuked you, let me go. And Satan had to back off. Why? Because that happened where? On earth. And the Bible says with, without two or three witnesses, nothing is established here. God is the first witness he has spoken. You need to proclaim what he has said and then it's going to be established. Keep proclaiming what the Lord of hosts has spoken. Alrighty, the two other things, we'll get to it later. Let us break bread. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because the entrance of your word. You know what? I'm going to show you one more thing. I just... Oh yeah, you know, you know how this thing is. In fact, I will show you two more things very quickly because I already said, and the Lord is saying to show you. Look at the rest of verse, uh, Zechariah chapter one. Maybe somebody was looking at Zephaniah and that's why it didn't look like my one. He says, again proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. Folks, I forgot, and the Holy Spirit reminded me, the Lord told me, tell them, let them speak up like they want to be heard from on high. Brother Matthew, sometimes we're too sophisticated in this Roman civilization to actually speak up with confidence. There are times when we pray with words that cannot be uttered. We pray like Hannah, wherein our mouths are moving, but our voices are not heard. But do you know how to get to that state? You get to that state because you have already spent all the voice. Now your mouth is just moving. So spend the voice first. Speak up, proclaim, not whisper, not suggest, not explain. You don't have to explain yourself to the forces that govern life. You don't have to explain yourself to principalities and powers. You proclaim. Sometimes the reason why our thoughts drown us is because we're not speaking enough. You need to proclaim what the Lord has said. And you need to say it with authority. It's not a cultural thing. It's a kingdom thing. You understand what I mean? It just so happens that some cultures are accustomed to speaking loud anyway, but that doesn't mean that they're even using it for spiritual conquest. So what do we do? We proclaim, speak out loud, hear it yourself, what you believe. The second thing, that's the second thing. The third thing is this, don't be tired of proclaiming. The very first word in that sentence says, again. Big mace, again. When I say it the first time, and I wake up the next day and nothing has happened, I will say it again. You see, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, he says, do not pray with much repetition of words. He said, because that's what the heathen do, because they think that by much repetition, the Lord is going to hear them. He says, no, your father is not hard of hearing. 
So what is, what, what's going on right here is not you repeating the same prayer to God. This is you repeating the same confession so that you can continue to believe and so that demons can back off. There are deaf and dumb spirits that don't just hear easily. You have to proclaim. Such that even if they can't hear you, they can read your lips and they're like, oh, Stephen is mad today. We better go back to hell. Again, don't give up. Emma, don't give up. You know what I'm saying? You already know. While I was speaking, the Lord was showing to you, do not give up. I see you, you laid a table prepared as though you were expecting guests to come and eat. And after a while, you rolled up the table again. He says, spread your cloth and set the table. They will come. They will come. The ones who need to be around your table to keep you company, to make you laugh, to make you feel like you're not alone, they will come. Not the wrong company that just want to eat and leave you alone. The right people will come. You see, because you have something to give to them. You have gifts that you need to give to them so that you can expand and receive more. Spread your cloth again. Let us pray. In fact, did we break bread? Okay, let's go back to that one. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. Praise the Lord for the entrance of your word. Jesus, you are life. And your life is our light. And you said that the bread was your body, the wine was your blood, and the blood of the animal of sacrifice is the life of that animal. And so the blood of the Lamb of God is the life of Christ. And so, Lord, as we receive your body and your blood into our beings today, doing so in remembrance of you, let us see and experience more of your life in us, the glorified life in the mighty name of Jesus. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him this day. Amen. I want you to say that I will arise. I will arise. I will arise. Father, your people are committed to rising now let them receive the illumination. Let them receive the light of revelation that they may know who they are by remembering who you are. In the mighty name of Jesus. This is a word for a couple of people here, in fact, and I want everybody to tap into it. The prodigal son had been reduced to the base most level of life. He was eating the food of pigs. He was, he, the only job he could find was the job of feeding pigs. Have you ever thought about the fact that pigs don't need help feeding? Just show them where the food is, they can feed themselves. So whoever hired him, hired him just because they're like, okay, we just want to help this miserable fellow. You can go feed the pigs. And he was eating their pods. And then the Bible says suddenly, he says, wait a minute. Even the servants in my father's house, they're doing better than this. Even the least in my father's kingdom is better than this. And the Bible says the moment he remembered his father's house, he rose up. He says, I will arise now and go. The moment to have revelation of who your father is, you will remember who you are and you will get up from where you are. Because until you rise, nobody sees the light. So I want to encourage you today. Press in. Let him show you who you are. Let him show you by revelation your father's house where there are many mansions. Your father's house where there is love enough for you and others. Your father's house. It is time to rise. God bless you. Alan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's give God glory for this word tonight. We're going to prepare for offering.
And um, my brother Kenyatta, when you have time, will you just click the offer slide there? Thank you, sir. Should be up on the screen. I want us to uh, uh, give him praise, to give him faith for what the Lord has done, what he's doing with us. And, uh, you know, I keep saying it, how plainly the Lord has been speaking to us um, this season that we know what to do. The book, uh, Psalm chapter 26, verse 7, it reads, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. Let's give in thanksgiving. Let's give in praise to what the Lord has done for what he's doing in us because even tonight so much was revealed that we can take home. How many would agree that this was such a plain message and we can see how to apply it right now? Okay, so that's, that's such a blessing, you know. And um, so let's give in that. We'll have the offering details here to our family online. We will have several ways to give. Uh, you can give via online at communion.house slash give. Uh, cash app at communion house as well as our PayPal. Uh, you'll see those items on the screen there. And for us here, if you need an envelope, it is there on the table. And we'll just wait just a couple of seconds. And we will go ahead and lift up our offering. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. There is none like you. Lord, we thank you for what you have given us this night. For Lord, truly you have granted unto us the spirit of understanding, even and as many agreed upon the word that was received, O oh God, and how we can pick it up and run with it, how we can apply it immediately, truly understanding is in this house. Wisdom and insight, revelation is in this house. Oh God, we ask of thee, just as you have given it us, as we give to you, let these offerings be pleasing in your sight. Let them be found so sweet smelling unto you, oh God. Father, we thank you for every day we go deeper in intimacy and relationship with your Holy Spirit. Oh God, we give you praise for your son. We give you praise for you, our daddy. There's none like you. Father, we know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, that all silver is yours, all gold is yours. Father, we thank you for yet another opportunity in this moment, in this time of reverencing you and giving unto you to walk by faith, oh God. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And everyone said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. We need to pray for Matthew. Okay. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. Alan, do you have anything else you wanted to say for the broadcast? Okay, good. So let's um, cut out the broadcast uh, for the sake of what we're about to do next. I